Good morning. Welcome to Charlestown Presbyterian Church. It's wonderful to see all of you here this morning. We're glad you're here. If you're a first time guest, welcome. We're uh, excited you're with us today. I do want to highlight some announcements as we begin our worship service. Uh, the session has called for a congregational meeting in two weeks. The purpose for that is to elect officers and the nominating committee for next year. The information for that is in the bulletin. I'm not going to bore you by reading all of that. Uh, today we are also uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper during this worship service. And if you are worshiping with us at home, please be sure to have bread and juice nearby so you can participate with us when we do that part of the service. With regard to communion, and I'll say something about this again, uh, it's a little different than what you might be used to. So what we've done is each tray has half bread and half juice. So when the servers come, they'll invite you to, you know, they'll say the body of Christ broken for you, and you take your bread, the blood of Christ shed for you, take some juice. If you uh, need gluten-free, there are three in the very middle that are gluten-free. So if you're not gluten-free, leave those for the folks who need that. So uh, work, if you're not gluten-free, work from the outside in. That's the best way to do that. Uh, so the servers will need to get into kind of the pew in front of you to make that happen. If there's not room, they'll, they'll figure it out. We've, we'll get this. Uh, the pandemic has taught us one thing. It's taught us that we can survive bumps in the road. So we'll get through this, folks. I know we will. There are a number of other important announcements in the bulletin, so please be sure later today to take a look at those when you have time. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Will forgive and help them. 
I invite you now to join me in the responsive call to worship, which today is taken from the 105th Psalm. Let us read responsively. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Our first song this morning is from the hymnal number 33, Praise the Lord, God's Glory Show. seated. Let us now go to God and confess our sins, first using the unison prayer that is printed in the bulletin, and we will follow that with a time of silent prayer. Let us pray together. You have called us blessed, O God, and washed us in the waters of grace. You have called us a family, O God, and bound us by the indwelling of your Spirit. Forgive us, O Holy One, when we forget that we belong to you, when we bind ourselves to the illusion of independence, the myth of supremacy, or the fear of what might happen if we placed our trust in something beyond ourselves. Forgive us, Holy God, and by your mercy, Free us from all that keeps us bound. Amen. Friends, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul reminds us in chapter 5 that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
seated. I'm here today on behalf of the Discipleship and Family Ministry Committee, and we would like to recognize our 2021 graduates. I would like to ask them to come forward at this time. Jessica and Megan. very special day today. All three of these young ladies have grown up in the church and we've watched them grow from little ones all the way to the adults that they are now and what a special journey they each have had. So I'd like to start with uh, Jessica and Jessica has graduated from Washington High School and she will be attending Ferrum College um, and Jessica, tell us what your plans are. Um, my plans are to either go into teaching or sports medicine in the fall, and then just see what goes from there. I'm going to come back to you in just a minute, okay? Um, <laughs> Megan. Um, Megan has graduated from Shepherd University with a Regents degree in... Uh, a Regents Bachelor of Arts degree, and Megan is planning to work while she um, pursues a master's in business administration. So Megan, is there anything else you would like to add to that? Um, I'm just going to be a good mom and take care of my kids and be a good member of the church. Wonderful. That is wonderful. Thank you. I could borrow your bulletin for just a minute. sure that I get this right. Jillian has graduated from the Model Secondary School for the Deaf, and she will attend Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., and Jillian is considering a degree in social work, and what a remarkable to pursue. Social workers are so important in the community. And Jillian, we are so proud of you. And we're so glad that you're here with us today to celebrate this. So our very, very best to you. So thank you. So congratulations to our graduates. I would like to leave you with some scripture before we pray. And this is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And if you could join me in prayer. Dear Lord, bless the lives of these graduates with goodness and love. Help them to use their gifts wisely, pursue their dreams boldly, and guide them to walk with you into the future with faith, hope, and great love. Amen. Congratulations. Congratulations to you. We did have one additional graduate, Emily uh, Pizzuto, and Emily 
is um, graduating from Washington High School, plans to attend WVU in the fall, and she qualified for state track and had a track meet today, so was not able to join us. So congratulations again. Now at this time, I'd like to switch gears just a minute and um, announce this year's uh, Frazier Music Scholarship. It, you know I've done this every year and I always tear up, so please excuse me for that. But in 2014, when um, my mother, uh, Seal Frazier, who's here today, and will be here every Sunday, um, but she, when she retired, the congregation of the Charlestown Presbyterian Church, that is you all, uh, created a scholarship in her honor. And that was in recognition of the 54 years she spent as organist and choir director um, here at the Charlestown Presbyterian Church. And at the same time that she retired, uh, my father passed away. And um, my father was a musician in his own right. Um, he was the band director um, he graduated with, as a band director uh, before he worked his way to be superintendent of schools in Jefferson County. Um, but he was a handbell member, a choir member. He sang bar barbershop. And music was just a huge part of their lives. So w when mom retired, the congregation created a scholarship through the Shepherd Foundation, um, along with um, a significant contribution from my brother, um, Aaron, uh, that scholarship is there in perpetuity. That means that um, it is there, um, it's established, it's there, and every year there will be a Fraser Music Scholarship recipient. And that was the vision of this Charlestown Presbyterian Church, that that legacy would live on. And I'd like to go to um, Psalm 100, one through five. Um, and that is the psalm that I just feel embodied the mu music legacy um, here in this church. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. And um, as we announce the recipient today, I just really go back to, to that psalm and what it means. Um, this year's recipient is a student from Martinsburg High School in Berkeley County, and her name is Sarah Singlinger. She will study music at Shepherd University this fall. Um, Sarah was not able to come today, and um, I spoke with Sarah, and she, um, three of her friends were being baptized in church today, and she really wanted to be there with, for that baptism, which certainly understand. So I um, would like to just again um, congratulate Sarah and thank the church of, the con of this congregation for this vision for a lasting legacy in music. Thank you.
teach me, O oh Lord, teach me, O oh Lord. So we come to the Lord in prayer. I have a number of joys this morning, also a number of concerns. Uh, today is Nancy and Larry's 62nd wedding anniversary. Aww. So, woohoo, well done. It's also my son Alex's 19th birthday. He hates being noticed. Don't clap. Um, <laughs> uh, also, uh, on Instagram, or not Instagram, Facebook, uh, Laura Van Zomeren posted that she has finished radiation. So, that is good news. So, things seem to be going well. For her and we're grateful for that. It's also a joy to have uh, the graduates here this morning to celebrate what they have done. That is also wonderful. Uh, on the concern side of things, uh, Pat Bowers is in need of our prayers. Pat suffered a massive stroke yesterday and she's at Fairfax Hospital. The situation does not look good, so please keep her and your family in prayers. Uh, Charlie Workman is undergoing uh, chemo and radiation right now, so you want to keep him in your prayers, and Mike Ishman is facing some health concerns. So let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, on this warm June day, we are grateful to be here, grateful that you have called us to be your people. It is our privilege and honor to gather today and worship you. Lord, we sometimes forget that Life does not revolve around us. It revolves around you. And so, Lord, prayer is a great way for us to come to you and remember this. And so as we come to you this morning, Lord, we pray that you would help us to focus on what's important, what our priorities need to be before you. Lord, we lift up our joys this morning. We are so thankful to have things to celebrate. Graduates, birthdays, wedding anniversaries. We give you thanks and praise for all of those milestones that people are celebrating. And we pray, Lord, that those would be moments of joy in each person's life. And we know, Lord, that you are indeed the great physician, and we are glad that we can come before you and lift up those who are sick. And we think especially today of Pat Bowers. Watch over her, Lord, and be with her family. Bless them and help her, Lord. If it is your will, bring healing to her, Lord. Lord, we lift up Charlie Workman to you and pray that you would be with him during this time. Help his process, his treatment to go well. And we pray, Lord, for a miracle in his life. And we lift up Mike to you, Lord, and pray for your continued care of him. Watch over him and bless him. And Lord, as we head into these summer months, Give us consistency in our faith journey, that we would always be faithful to you, that you would be our top priority, that our lives would be centered around what you want for us. For we ask this in Christ's precious name, praying the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now as we turn our focus to Scripture, let us first turn our attention to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for your word. And we ask now, Lord, that by the power of your spirit, you would give us understanding of your word. Help us to apply it rightly to our lives. Help us, O oh Lord, to learn the lesson you have for us this day. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Our passage this morning is Matthew chapter 15. We are looking at verses 32 through 38. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to open to that. The passage is also printed in the bulletin this week. Also, it is, uh, you, you can use the Pew Bible, whatever Bible you would like this morning. Matthew chapter 15, beginning at verse 32. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the, the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was in high school and I was thinking about my future, I vacillated between pursuing something in film and video production or music. In spite of my love of music, I ended up heading towards a film degree. Now, one of the reasons for that might be surprising. I hated practicing. Hated it. Now, one of the weird things about music is that when you practice, you can very easily develop bad habits. And they have a way of staying with you. Hitting the wrong note can feel so right. And then when you're correcting it, playing the right note feels so wrong. And so music takes time, patience, and practice, practice, practice to learn the lesson. Sometimes a musician has to relearn a piece if they can't get it right. In this part of Matthew 15, Jesus performs an amazing miracle feeding a crowd that easily numbers between seven or 8,000 people. The passage tells us that 4,000 men were present, and it doesn't account for the women and children, so that's a reasonable estimate. Jesus is still in the Gentile region of Tyre and Sidon, and he spends three days healing the sick and performing miracles for a very large crowd. Now, if we go back one chapter, we can easily find the more popular feeding of the 5,000. People teach on that more, they preach on that more, and I knew that was coming and I didn't want to preach on both, so I thought I'd pick the more ignored passage, the less preached version of a feeding. But the events are similar. Large crowd, a meager amount of food, and some doubting disciples. Now, considering this comes after the feeding of the 5,000, the most telling moment in this feeding is verse 33. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great 
a crowd. Another way to translate that might be, and the disciples learned nothing from feeding the 5,000. It is very important not to miss the fact that Jesus once again takes something small and does something large with it. He does that in our lives daily. But a more profound lesson is buried in the question the disciples are asking. How in the world are we going to feed this many people? They once again doubt and focus on what can't be done instead of remembering what Jesus did not all that long ago. This is incredibly surprising considering what the disciples have witnessed since the feeding of the 5,000. They have seen Jesus perform countless miracles, deliver people from demon possession, walk on water, stop a storm, and raise a little girl from the dead. How in the world do these guys not get that Jesus is going to take care of feeding the people? Well, the answer to that question is simple. Sometimes we need to relearn the lesson. And life is full of countless examples of needing to relearn the lesson. The person who gets multiple DUIs hasn't learned the lesson. The friend who keeps dating or marrying the same kind of person hasn't learned the lesson. The people hoping elected officials will somehow behave differently this time still haven't learned the lesson. The musician who keeps making the same mistake over and over still hasn't learned the lesson. And on and on that list could go. Our passage demonstrates that God can use very little to create large results. And we also see in this passage that God always provides. And those are lessons that often bear repeating in our lives. And this is all part of our spiritual growth. And spiritual growth is a very personal matter. God doesn't hand out a syllabus with an outline upon our conversion and tell us how we should be studied so that we're ready when we're tested. Wouldn't it be great if God did that? We'd be prepared. We'd know the answers. Often we are faced with some challenge, and that challenge leads to us crying out for God. And we lean into our faith in those moments, and hopefully we become aware of what God is trying to teach us, what God wants us to learn. And one of the most interesting aspects of spiritual growth is that God often uses difficult circumstances to teach us. And we don't like that. Many Christians have bought into the nefarious teaching that God wants to bless us, make us prosperous. And yes, God wants that for us. But most of that blessing is waiting for us in our eternity, not in the temporal, not now. Look at the lives of the apostles, for, the, for example. All of them were dealing with trouble all of their lives. They were persecuted. Every single one of them was martyred for their faith. The idea that following Christ means material blessing is certainly attractive, but it's not all that biblical. But yes, God uses the hard moments. He uses the hard moments of our lives to teach us and then reteach us. And those moments are plentiful. If we need to learn patience, God will fill our lives with plenty of waiting. If we have to learn to rely on God for finances, he will fill our lives with scarcity. If we need to learn more of God's faithfulness, we will notice many moments where we hear ourselves say, I can't, or there's no way. When I was in school, and I knew I bombed a test, the greatest words I could ever hope to hear were, we're going to do a retest. Yes. That gave me time to study the material a little bit more and hopefully earn enough of a better grade to rectify my failure. 
Well, that's sort of how God operates, except he doesn't hold our failures against us, not in any way. But when we need to learn and grow, he will test us again and again until we learn what we need to learn. I don't know why the idea of God testing us is often met with derision. Before we buy a car, what do we do? We take a test drive. Before we buy a cell phone, what do we do? We look at the floor models, essentially testing them out to see which ones we like. Testing helps us know what we want. And when we need to learn something, testing reveals to us how much we've learned. It's not wicked or evil for God to test his children. When God tests us, it's not like he's hoping we fail. He wants us to learn and grow and trust him more. God's tests are meant to make us spiritually stronger. Sometimes, though, we need to relearn the lesson. Now, I think all of us can relate to the disciples' reaction to their question. Whenever we are faced with something large and seemingly insurmountable, our first reaction is often one of doubt. I'm reminded of a wonderful moment in Mark's gospel in chapter 9. A man comes to Jesus' disciples. His son is demon-possessed. The disciples try, but they cannot heal him. Listen to the exchange that follows in Mark chapter 9. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus heals the child and then tells the crowd that witnessed the healing, this kind can, cannot be driven out by anything except prayer. When our situation seems impossible, we must take it to Jesus. Even though the disciples seem to learn nothing from feeding the 5,000, when faced with the same scenario with the 4,000, they took it to Jesus. They gathered their bread and their fish, and they said, here's what we've got, Lord. In the Apostle Peter's first letter, he writes these words about taking our troubles to Christ. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Notice what these verses are encouraging. Keeping our lives humbly before Christ at all times. Why? Because life is hard not only for you and I, but for all of our brothers and sisters around the world everywhere. And in addition to that, we have an adversary that will use every possible circumstance to cause us to doubt our faith in Christ. And so the encouragement from Peter, who was there at the feeding of the 4,000, is to stay humble and constant before Christ so that we can endure all manner of trouble in this life. He also reminds us of an important promise, that one day, when either we go to be with Christ or he returns, we will be transformed once and for all into the people God desires us to be. That is the promise 
we must focus on. For if we don't, we will find ourselves learning the same lessons over and over. There are three truths to take away from this passage to make these points easy to remember. Each one of them is in always. There's also a P word in each one. If you like alliteration, I've got your back today. First, we are always in process. We never arrive at perfection on this side of eternity. And if you think you have, well then, there's a lesson to relearn there. So, there will always be somewhere where we need to grow, some lesson to learn and relearn and then relearn again. So even when we find ourselves caught in the loop of relearning an old lesson, we must remember that this is actually typical. We never arrive, we never learn completely what it means to fully and faithfully follow Christ. Not yet. We always need to grow more. We are always in process. Second, we must always be about prayer. As I grow older, I am realizing more and more how important this is and how deficient I am in this area. Lately, I have been sensing that the Lord is leading us as a congregation to be a people more focused on prayer. Like many people, I feel the pull of the urgent. I just don't have time to commit to prayer. At least that's what my brain tells me. I am convicted by those great words of Martin Luther, who was asked why he prayed so long each day. He said, I've got so much work today that I better spend two hours in prayer instead of one. Now, prayer is not that complicated. Prayer is talking to God, communicating with God, being in the presence of God, laying our hearts before God in a way that is humble. You can talk to God. You can use a journal. You can keep a list in your Bible of people and things you're praying for, whatever works. You can look at the calendar, pray for what's going on today or tomorrow in your life, whatever. Luther also said this about prayer, and I find this fascinating. The fewer the words, the better the prayer. Third, always remember the promise. When we come to faith in Christ, we belong to Christ, period. And one day we will go to be with him or he will return to us. And on that glorious day, we will experience and realize what we have hoped for for so long. Our eternity with him will begin and it will be in his presence it will be glorious there will be no struggle no doubt no sickness only joy and love forever when momentary struggles cast a shadow over that promise we can easily lose sight of what our lives are meant for even in our most difficult struggles our lives are to be lived for Christ, and his promises remind us of this. Always in process, always in prayer, always the promise. The feeding of the 4,000 in Matthew 15 reminds us of how important it is to remember these three things. Yes, there are times we will have to learn and relearn spiritual truths. It is an incredible act of grace that Christ does not give up on us. And so we stay the course, remembering that there is always more to learn, always more time to pray. We must always be focused on the promise. The size of the problem we face, by and large, is irrelevant. For even if we have the most meager resources when we turn to Christ and seek his help, he will accomplish the impossible. I close with these words from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction 
is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we are reminded this morning that we are always in process, that we should always be about prayer, and that we should always look to the promise. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability to do so, especially when we are facing the most difficult times in our lives, when we are facing lessons we need to relearn and understand. Help us, Lord, to see you at work in our lives, to see you when you are moving, and to learn what you would have us learn, that we will grow closer to you and fix our eyes firmly on you. In your name we pray, amen. And now we will continue in worship as Penny plays our offertory, which will be followed by the presentation of our gifts and offerings. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for providing so much in our lives. And it is indeed an honor and privilege to give back, to give to your work in the world. And so, Lord, we commit this offering to you and pray that it is pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. So I just want to remind you what you can expect as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. The trays will have both bread and cup. Take both. Maybe put the juice in the little cup holder and keep the bread handy. We will partake together. What that means is, hang on to it. Don't eat it or drink it right away. I'll direct you when we're all ready to go together. And that adds a special element of unity and togetherness to it, especially since this is the first time since we We have celebrated the Lord's Supper together in this sanctuary since March of last year. So, woohoo! Or at least, I think so. Whatever. So, let us prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We are coming to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ today. And this is his table. He bids welcome all who call on his name by faith, who have been baptized into his name, to come to his table to take of the bread, and to drink of the cup. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, O Lord, we come with thankful hearts 
remembering all that you have done for us, remembering that your grace is given to us freely. It is not by anything we do, not by our works, not because we are so righteous, but because you are righteous. And so, Lord, we come humbly before you this day, eager to be reminded of your grace, eager to be reminded of the sacrifice you made for us. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to receive the bread and the cup. And we set aside the bread and the cup, O oh Lord. Sanctify these common elements for your purposes and your glory. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Take eat, and do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the remission of sins. Take and drink all of it and do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns the gifts of God for the people of God. body of Christ, 
broken for us. And Christ's blood shed for our sin. Let us pray. And gracious God, what a joy it is to be together celebrating this sacrament this morning. And we give you thanks and praise. Not only are we able to do it here, but we are able to be joined virtually by those who are worshiping at home with us. And we thank you, Lord for the way this sacrament connects us to you and to one another. Remind us as we go through our days the truth and the grace and the beauty of this sacrament, this reminder of our faith in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our final song for the morning is number 320 in the hymnal, The Church of Christ in Every Age. Let us join in our sending, brothers and sisters, as the Church of Jesus Christ, go from this place. Knowing Christ, growing in God's love, and serving as the Holy Spirit leads. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.